blessing to those who have this knowledge base, who are strong in their faith, and says that we have the freedom to eat this meat. We have freedoms in Christ to partake in certain things. We know that these idols are nothing. They're man-made. And they don't per pertain to me. We don't have a problem. That's who he's addressing initially here. And now we look at, he's addressing the people who are struggling with whether it is okay or not to eat this meat that someone sacrificed to an idol, probably and often uh, are wrestling perhaps with the with the uh, uh, with it because uh, it had become a strong belief in their past because of their culture, before because of what they practice, they're struggling with it. There are Christians today who are struggling with whether it is okay to exercise in a studio that offers it as a yoga class. Primarily because of what yoga started out as and is to some people. The connection that yoga had with the view to attain some sort of permanent peace in their meditation, when maybe it is simply just a form of exercise for some. It's a way to stay in shape. There are eight yoga poses that people practice to stay in shape and have nothing to do with the Middle Eastern or the Hindu or the India background that was associated with it. Other areas that maybe people struggle with and whether it is okay or not okay is to have a Christmas tree. A Christmas tree is a pagan background to it, if you look at it. Coloring Easter <coughs> eggs has a pagan background to it. Is it okay? Is it not okay? These are some of the things that Christians may struggle with even today. He goes on to say that as a Christian, these idols are nothing. They don't ex excuse me, they don't exist. They're man-made. As we look at verse four, verse in, in uh, yeah, verses four through six. He goes back to the question, so then about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no uh, God but one. <clears throat> For even if there were some so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods, yes, people make up gods, they make up idols all over the place and all the time. <coughs> Yet for us, Yet for you as Christians, new Christians, there is but one God. The Father from whom all things came, for whom we live, and there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Idols are nothing, is what he's communicating. He's instructing these weaker Christians, these less mature Christians, the truth of the matter is there is only one God. God the Father, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we worship Him. We follow Him. So He's instructing them. He's giving them a knowledge base to help them work through these questions, these concerns that they have. Now, I don't know if there's too many of us, maybe there is, that I'm not aware of, today that regard eating meat a problem. Maybe there is in our midst, I don't know. It's not too big of a problem today. But we do have some areas that are freedoms for some and not freedoms for some others. <laughs> Such as, does a Christian have the freedom to drink alcohol? Is it okay? Is it not okay? How about coffee? 
Coffee has a drug in it. Caffeine. Is it okay or not okay to drink coffee? Some Christians raise a question about smoking. Is it okay or not okay? Or public dancing. Kind of interesting, one of the songs we sing was about dancing. <laughs> Is it okay to or not okay to dance? David danced, by the way. How about watching movies? Having a TV in your home? Playing video games? D&D, &D, Call of Duty, and Modern Warfare, and all those kinds of things. Is that okay or not okay? Don't, be throw, don't throw anything at me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Paul is just addressing this. Some have the freedom and feel the freedom to partake, and some don't. So that's what's happening here. You know what? I know what we should do. Maybe we should all get together and make a list of things that we all agree on that we're not going to do. Good idea? No. Guess, <laughs> guess what that's called? <laughs> it's called legalism. It's called legalism about a set of rules. And Paul addresses that and he says, you know what? It doesn't matter if you eat meat or don't eat meat. It does not merit anything with God. It doesn't make you any better of a person whether you have these convictions or these convictions. It doesn't merit that. You are no better off either way in God's economy. Here's what he says about what we should do about it. We are to exercise our freedoms with regard to one another. This is where the love trumps knowledge. We are to be governed by love for one another over what we know, what we have freedoms to do, or not to do. But not everyone knows this, Paul addresses here in verse 7. Not everyone has developed the same convictions, the same freedoms. And so love says to the individual who understands that he has certain freedoms, that not all people are able to do what I am <coughs> free to do. They don't see things the way I do in particular. And love says, I am going to, if need be, to put aside my freedom so that I may not stumble someone else. So that I may not cause them to fall or weaken their faith in some way because of my freedom. He says, some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. Paul here admits in the word of God, he acknowledges that those whose conscience is weak are not able to engage in some freedoms. The weak person he's talking about is an immature person, someone who doesn't have the understanding or the ability or the faith to be able to exercise certain freedoms that are okay for others. And it does not make one person better than another. That's where he says, but food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. So Paul challenges those who are able to exercise their freedom in Christ to be careful 
be careful that their actions, their liberties, do not cause a weak, a more immature Christian to stumble, to fall, to be wounded in their faith. Be careful, he says, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brother in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. Love for the brother trumps your liberty. They exercise your liberty. Paul's instructing here is that although we may have the freedom to indulge in certain activities, it's more important to restrain yourself. If it causes someone else to stumble, causes someone else to be hurt by your actions. Love is really the key here, isn't it? Love for one another, care for one another, not causing someone else to stumble. And before you decide to indulge in a freedom, that many of us may feel like we have. I think it's best to consider how it affects others. How it affects the one sitting next to you. How it will add or detract from their faith. From following Jesus Christ. Will they stumble? Will they fall? Will they be coerced? Will they be encouraged to partake of something that is against their conscience, against their will? I ran across, I'm going to finish with this, I think is a great example of what Paul is talking about here. The choice that someone has made for the sake of others. It's by, it's by Dr. Ironside. He once told of an illustration on one occasion, there was a picnic with other Christians and a man who had been converted from the Muslim religion from following Muhammad was there. A girl brought a basket of sandwiches up to this man and asked if he would like some. He said, what kind do you have? Oh, she said, I'm afraid all we have left are ham and pork. He said, don't you have any beef or lamb? And she replied, no, they're all gone. Well, he said, then I won't have any. Knowing that he was a Christian, she said to him, Well, sir, I am, I am really surprised. Don't you know that as a Christian you are free from all these food restrictions and that you can eat pork or ham if you like? He said, Yes, I know that. I know I'm free to eat pork, but I'm also free not to eat it. I'm still involved with my pam family in the Near East. And I know that when I go home once a year, the first question my father will ask me is, have those infidels taught you to eat the filthy hog meat yet? If I have to say to him, yes, father, I will be banished from that home and have no further witness in it. But if I can say, as I have always been able to say, no, Father, no pork has ever passed my lips, then I have continued admittance to the family circle, and I am free to tell them of the joy I have found in Jesus Christ. So we are free to eat or free not to eat, as the case may be. Love for one another is the key here in our liberties and our exercise of our freedoms. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this instruction this morning. 
I trust Father that it was clear enough for most of us, Lord, to understand what you're saying here. And yes, we do have freedoms in Christ. We are not we are not hindered, Lord, from partaking and being involved with certain things, Lord. Because of your Son, Jesus Christ, has freed us, Lord, from certain things, Lord, that we are not to exercise our freedom if it's going to hurt and, and make our brothers and sisters stumble, Father. I pray, God, that this morning that we would understand that love for one another, Lord, is, is paramount, is huge is needed in the church today. And I, Father, I just ask that you would just encourage us, you would strengthen us, Lord, individually to practice that on a regular basis. That we would be just as much interested in others as we are in ourselves. Thank you for providing this portion to us and as we continue, Father, to understand your word. Well, I'd like to now just uh, uh, just uh, continue uh, our worship of you by our giving uh, uh, from uh, what you've given us, Lord, from our finances. Thank you, Father, again, for the ability to work, to make wealth that comes from you. And Father, we honor you this morning by giving you a first part, Lord, of what you've given us. So we ask you to bless uh, the offering this morning. In Jesus' name. Exciting times with baptisms this morning as many well, three individuals have given their lives to the Lord and want to publicly declare that to you all. So we're encouraged for that. Uh, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story where the disciples are out in the boat. Jesus comes walking out. You're scared to death. Oh, there he is. What, what is that? What is that? And Jesus uh, is walking on the water, and, and Peter wants to come to him. And so he steps out of the boat onto the water. And, you know, what we think about is, oh, you have little faith because you saw the waves and you sunk in, Peter, haha. -ha. But, like, Peter was standing on the water for a little while. And, and all the rest of the guys were in the boat. They didn't get to experience what Peter experienced when he trusted in Jesus, just for even a split second. And uh, we had a meeting uh, last week for some of the servants at youth group, and I asked them, when was the last time you took a risk for, for Christ? When was the last time you, you took a chance and stepped out in faith for the Lord? And I, and I challenge you guys in the same way, and that's what this song's about, is uh, really uh, stepping out in faith. So when we step out, he holds us up, and, and we get to experience God in a new way. So I just want to encourage you in that.
here at uh, Valley View, we practice believer's baptism. When someone uh, repents, asks God for forgiveness of their sins, and trusts in Jesus alone by faith, uh, we believe that they are saved at that point. That having believed, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So as we take our next step in obedience and trusting Jesus, we're called to be baptized. Matthew 28 says that we should baptize. After a person is saved, we believe, or believe that we believe that they should experience baptism. Uh, baptism is a, is a symbol of an inward thing that has already happened in a believer's heart. That as they go under, they're acknowledging and connecting with the death of Christ, that Jesus died and was buried. And in the same way we've died, when we've accepted Christ as Lord, we are no longer in charge of our lives. We are no longer the boss. And we want to turn our lives over to Him. And so we connect with the death of Christ in baptism. And then as you come up out of the water, that we are raised to new life. Now, we believe that happens when they first believe that Jesus was their Savior and trusted in Him for forgiveness of sins. But this is a symbol of that before, for them and before us as the church. That they are raised to new life, that the, the old things have passed away and they're a new creature. <clears throat> and so it is a physical represent, representation of that happening in their lives. And so we're excited this morning. We have three who have given their lives to the Lord. Uh, and so we want to actually have them come up. Aiden, if you and your dad and mom and sister would like to come up. We're going to just give them uh, just an opportunity to introduce uh, themselves. And if they want to say a few words, have a, have a few words. So. Okay. Um, I really like uh, to be baptized. Because I kind of think it's like getting to know God better or getting closer to Him. Well, Caleb and I <laughs> uh, have been talking to Wiley, have come to youth group for a while, and uh, one day we got together and talked about salvation and what that means, and, and, you know, he had been around everybody for a while, and I don't think anyone really knew uh, that he had not accepted the Lord, uh, and, and so we had that conversation, and I think it was a little bit later, he talked with his godmother, and she kind of talked with him about it, I guess, some more, and at that time he had decided to accept Christ uh, as his Savior, um, but it just shows you the importance of, even though there are people around, uh, we kind of assume a lot of things, that if someone comes to church or if someone goes to youth group or, or whatever, that they're saved, uh, and that's just not the case, um, and so we just want to make sure that, you know, if, if you ever have questions, that be, be encouraged to uh, take a risk and, and share, and I think, you know, Caleb was really appreciative of it, because it got them thinking about a lot of things they've never thought about before, I think. So, uh, just I want to encourage you in that. So, anybody want to step up there? Don't, don't trip. You can move that out. Thank 
accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, do you believe that He is the Son of God? And that He has is, he is died for your sins to allow you to the kingdom of heaven? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I do thank you. certificate here to uh, Aiden Scott Bailey, who's getting changed, <laughs> <laughs> Ashley Nicole May, and uh, Caleb Orion Nichols, that's a cool middle name, man, I know that, yeah, awesome. We present the certificate of baptism to you today from Valley View Community Church on February 16, 2014, professing to follow Jesus Christ in the obedient observance of baptism. So let's pray with them, for them, uh, before we have our last song, and uh, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for saving these young people, Lord, for giving them the understanding that they were sinners and they needed a Savior. We pray, Father, that you would, uh, as you have already, Lord, fill them with the Holy Spirit to be guided by the Holy Spirit in their life. I pray that they would be uh, uh, connected, Lord, with you throughout their whole life. They would follow you in your ordinances, in your word, Father. I pray that you would impart to them, Lord, wisdom on how to please you in every way. We ask, Father, that you would protect them. As we know, Lord, that this world, Lord, is, uh, is not about you entirely. So we ask that you protect them, protect their faith, Lord. They would stay close to your scriptures. I pray for their, their families, Lord, that they would encourage them and instruct and, and teach the ways of you. And so we just commit them to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this, this uh, opportunity this morning to witness what you've already done in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Stay up there,